you all for coming, welcome. Um, what I was asked to do is kind of talk about some of the research that I've been doing on a village level, uh, what we call place-based history, um, and how we take that from an academic setting and bring it back into the village, bring it back to the communities that we're talking about uh, as professors, as scholars, and so forth. So all I really want to do today is share with you, um, invite you to remember this place called Sumai, um, a place many of you in this room are very familiar with, a place that many of you kids in here are descendants of. Um, to talk about the research that I did with my elders as part of getting my master's degree and the aftermath of that research. This is 12 years in the making. I did my MA 12 years ago, um, and I thought I was done with this Sumai research, but every year since then it has spiraled into so many different community projects. And so I wanted to share that with you to think about how we can keep doing that as a community in Guam, in focusing on our own stories and our own places and our own villages so that we are telling our stories and not leaving it to people from the outside to do for us. Um, and I think it's a very appropriate time, especially as we celebrate this 74th liberation, um, to think back to the experience of our Manaina through the war, but more importantly, their, their story of survival over these last 74 years, and maybe some of the things that are still unresolved from this thing we call Liberation Day. So that's what I'm gonna be getting to today. Um, usually when I, when I talk, I, when I decided to embark on this journey of researching this place called Sumai, it's a very personal topic. Both my grandmothers come from Sumai. Um, so I really had to think, what am I doing by taking these stories into an academic space, into the university that my grandmothers never set foot in, into a space that my elders in the village probably didn't want to go to? Um, what was the, the obligation that came with that? Um, it took a lot of reflecting on who I was and what I was bringing to that table and what I was going to bring to the community. Uh, those of you that don't know me, there's me, very big. Um, <laughs> I was born here on Guam, but at a very young age was uprooted and moved to San Francisco with my parents and siblings. My father worked for Pan American Airlines. Um, if some of you in here won't remember Pan Am, but most of us will. Um, in 1984, we moved to San Francisco. I was very privileged growing up in the States, not privileged because I was in the States, but privileged because my father worked for the airline and we were constantly in Guam, um, constantly back and forth every summer. Christmas, Easter, funeral, wedding, birthday, whatever came up throughout the year, we were constantly back in Guam. But for a, for a lot of my formative years, I was in California, 84 to 97. In 97, I came home to Guam and enrolled at the University of Guam. Um, completed my degree, and in 2006, I went over to Honolulu to work on graduate school. And when I was done with that, again, I came back home. So my upbringing, um, although many of my years, I think I calculated, probably 50% of my life has been away from Guam, we were constantly being brought back to Guam and anchored on this island. And so when I decided to become an academic and a scholar, um, this was kind of the thing that framed what I decided to do in my research, what I decided um, to do professionally. Now, in some ways, when people go to university, they, they do what's required of them, they take exams, they write papers, and they're done with it. For me, I really had to reflect on what I was doing in the university. Um, because I never ever in my life, I was never a stellar student. Um, my grades from elementary, middle, and high school are not good. Um, I never really cared much for school. Um, Really, what I base myself in is I come from a large, very close-knit family network. Um, my maternal side of the family, uh, my grandfather, Antonio Borja Perez, familia Zinza, and my grandmother, uh, Maria Sablan Pengelin and Perez, a uh, big influence in my life. They had eight children. My mother is top center. Um, many of, I think all of them are here except my mom and one of my aunties who's off island. They had eight children together. My cousins and I refer to them affectionately as the great eight. Um, 29 grandchildren and I think 64 great grandchildren. I've lost count over the years. Um, but this family is a very large extended family network. And this has always kind of influenced me professionally, personally, spiritually, and emotionally. So I come from this on my mom's side. My dad's side, quite small, right? 
My grandfather was from Hawaii, Andres Augustine Viernes, and my grandmother, Guadalupe Sablon Santos Viernes, Familian Maguet, comes from Sumai. They had two sons, my dad and his brother Franklin, only four grandchildren, 10 great grandchildren. Whether it was my mother's side of the family or my father's side of my family, I always kind of saw myself as part of this larger network. Um, we did not grow up, we were not raised as individuals, right? This idea of individualism was not a big part of our upbringing. Um, it was always about the clan, the family. So when I come into academia, when I talk about the research that I've done, I was not born an academic, none of us are. I come at academia as a son, as a grandson, as a nephew, a brother, a cousin, an uncle, and a godfather. Okay? I throw this out to you because I think when we think about the projects we want to do for Guam, right, what we want to contribute to academia, we need to look back at where we're coming from and figure out what is the contribution I'm going to make, not to myself as an individual, but this larger network that we call family. Okay, so that's just a bit about me and where I'm coming from. When I went over to University of Hawaii, um, like I said, I was never a stellar student. I was never really a good student until I got into graduate school. And when I got there, when you go to university, for, there's quite a few of you in here with terminal degrees. When you go to university, the academy tells you your job is to create original research and contribute to scholarship and to knowledge. And I had no idea what that meant when I went to graduate school. I was very lucky because the program that I went into, Pacific Island Studies, they believed in that. But they also told us whatever kind of research you're going to do, it better be something you're passionate about. And it better be something that's going to serve the communities that you're researching about. Right? You don't just go in somewhere and get information, write your paper, get your degree, and that's it. Your research has to go back to your community. So it brought up these questions, well, what kind of scholarship am I going to produce? Is it going to be a book in the library? Is it going to be something else? Very confusing, right? We almost felt like we were being pulled in different directions. Am I supposed to be a scholar or am I supposed to be a member of the community? When I was kind of dealing with this and figuring out what am I supposed to do, for a master's degree, you have to write a master's thesis. I think it's like a 200-page paper, right? What am I going to write 200 pages about that I'm passionate about and that will serve my community? And as I thought about this, um, I turned to Facebook. How many of you use Facebook? <laughs> Sometimes you can click on Facebook and take personality quizzes. And I did that, and it said the quiz was show what is the most frequently used words on your Facebook. Quite obviously for me, it was Guam. So I said, if Facebook is telling me that Guam's supposed to be the focus, then it must be true, right? Um, so this kind of happened, and all roads just kind of led back to these two women, the matriarchs of my family, my grandmothers, my mother's mother, Maria, and my father's mother, Guadalupe. Everything came back to them. As I was in my head saying, what is this research going to be about? It came back to these women who had a big role in my life, but whose story was always a part of my upbringing. What also came into my head as a scholar, a lot of times when you go to university, you have to develop frameworks, right? What's the theoretical framework that we're going to use? I started playing with that idea. Um, and I started thinking, well, what are the things that, what does it mean to be Chamorro? What does it mean to be a Chamorro scholar, right? Um, and I started playing with these ideas. And all of it came to this idea of Vinafa Maule. We have this concept in our culture that everything we do is supposed to be to make it good, right? How do we achieve an Maulik? A lot of it is in through service to the family, to the clan. It's in service to the land, the sea, and to your village. It's in this idea of tsunsuli, reciprocating all the good that has come to you. It's in this idea of humility, right? So I came up with this research framework and I stood back and I said, well, what kind of 200-page paper am I going to write that's going to support all of these things, that's going to uplift my family, that's going to pay homage to the land and the sea and the village that I come from? What am I going to do that's going to reciprocate everything that has been done for me? 
um, from within my family, from within my larger community? And what am I going to do that's going to be respectful? All right, so as academics, there's all kinds of frameworks that we use. This is one that I, I just kind of played with. And again, it came back to these two women. Um, why? Because when you grow up, as my generation did with your grandparents, every day is a story, right? Every day they talked about their life as children. They talked about their experiences. And all of those stories led to a place called Sumai, right? For those of you who are unfamiliar, Sumai Village, um, located near Opera Harbor today, dates back over 1,400 years. The earliest human evidence in Sumai, 600 AD. Okay? It's a long time. It's surrounded by a natural harbor. So this is prime real estate, right? Fertile farming lands and over 2,000 people by the time World War II rolls around. This is 10% of Guam's population. And so Sumai as a village in the 1900s becomes a hub. Um, it becomes a hub of commerce, travel, communications, and employment. Even since the Spanish were here, Sumai was really making a name for itself. One of the former Spanish governors, he noted the houses of the barrio of Sumai, though few, are almost all well constructed and sided with planks because they are built by people who moved there from the city. The situation of this village is very good by reason of its proximity to the principal harbor of the island. It has very good water and fresh breezes. While the extensive farmland and its immediate vicinity would make it possible for a population as great or larger than that of Hagatnya to live there in much comfort. Since 1870, okay, Sumai was growing and it was attracting people to leave the city and to move there, right? Why? Sumai becomes a communications hub. The Commercial Pacific Cable Company establishes its complex there, literally linking Manila to Guam, to Wake Island, to Honolulu, to San Francisco. This is established in 1900, and you should understand, this is the days before WhatsApp and Facebook and cell phones. This is a major technological advancement. It makes it so that all of these places can communicate with each other almost instantly. This is built in Sumai, so it attracts people to employment opportunities, uh, to the technology, and so forth. Sumai becomes a travel hub. Pan American Airlines lands its clippers beginning in 1936 and establishes the Pan American Hotel in Sumai. Right, so Sumai becomes this stopover point for people who are traveling to Asia or from Asia to the United States. Okay? Um, because of this, Sumai also becomes a military hub. The US Marines establish their barracks and their operations in Sumai. All of these things are uplifting the village as a hub. People are moving into Sumai to get jobs, right? wage paying jobs. People are moving into Sumai and it's growing in population, it's growing in prominence. Okay? Um, sadly though, Sumai's history kind of comes to an end in 1941. Because it, has, it is a communications hub, a travel hub, an employment hub, this is the first place in Guam that becomes bombed by Japanese invading forces on December 8, 1941. After the occupation in 1944, the United States comes back to Guam and recaptures the island. And this is what Sumai looks like in 1944. It's destroyed, right? It's flattened. After the war, the people of Sumai want to go back to their village. They want to go back and find whatever they can from their life before the war. Um, and unfortunately, that never happens. So in 1941, if this is where the history of Sumai ends, this is where the start of my story as somebody from Sumai actually begins. Right? So I wanted to talk to you about that today. 1948, the US Naval government files a lawsuit suing the people of Guam. Civil case 5-49, also known as a declaration of taking, is filed in the court in Hagatnya. The naval government takes 2,471 acres, or 10 million square meters of land, specifically in Pidi, Sumai, and Agat. 
This includes portions of PD and Sumai, but takes, uh, excuse me, it includes portions of PD and Agate, but takes Sumai in its entirety. Sumai becomes the only village in Guam in its entirety to be seized by the US military. Okay? For Sumai, almost 350 pieces of land, privately, commercially owned land, are taken away by the US naval government. Okay? No compensation. Right? Um, basically, this land is now ours. You may not come back here anymore. Right? And so for Sumai, while it was a thriving village before the war, today is in US naval base Guam. Federal government property, which the people of Sumai cannot freely go into and out of as they please. This history of Sumai that I've just given you is very well documented. Open a textbook. Uh, Robert Rogers, Destiny's Landfall, Pedro Sanchez's book. They all talk about this. They all talk about how important Sumai was. They all talk about Sumai is now a naval base. What those textbooks do not talk about is the people who used to live there, right? Who, were they, who they were, what did they go through, and where are they now? So for me as a researcher, that didn't match what I learned growing up with my grandmothers. My grandmothers told us a lot of stories about Sumai. They did not tell us about the marine barracks or the commercial Pacific Cable Company. Their story was very different, right? Their story did not end in 1944. And so my thing was, I'm going to use this topic as my research focus. I want to tell the stories that have not been told in all of these years, all of these decades. Okay? So I want to share with you some of those stories today. Um, what I did when I was doing this research is I basically went to everybody in Santa Rita that I knew, all of our elders, and said, can I interview you? Right? A lot of them were my relatives. A lot of them were friends of the family from church. And it was an amazing experience. Most researchers, when they go and do interviews, they have a, a list. These are the questions that I want to ask, right? I had one question. And for every interview subject, I asked this one question. They talked about it for three hours or more. And that question was, it wasn't even a question. Tell me about Sumai. That's all I asked. That's all I said. And I don't think a researcher, a formal researcher, had ever asked these people to talk about themselves. And so what came about from that? My late aunt, Virginia Sablon Pangolin in Paris, very simply, there was no place like Sumai. I asked another aunt of mine about Sumai, in Gracia Cruz Diaz Pangolin in Mas Maulik Nalugat Sumai. Sumai is the best place. Right? These very simple reactions to that question were very telling. There's no place like Sumai. This is the best place. My late paternal grandmother, people in Sumai were very friendly. They helped each other out and minded their own business, right? She remembers a very strong sense of community, right? That they were very friendly to each other. Um, some of you remember Tantong Anyo, Conception, Conception. All the neighbors are helping each other out, especially during those fish seasons. Everybody will share. There's no buying. If somebody goes fishing, there's plenty of fish. Everyone will get some. These memories of a community that really took care of each other. Okay, something that we don't necessarily see in Guam today, but this was their memory. That as a community, they were thriving. Unfortunately, they were not allowed to return to Sumai, and instead, the history books tell you they were relocated to Santa Rita. I have a problem with that term because they weren't relocated, they were evicted and exiled. For those of us that have been to Santa Rita, who it's a village, there was nothing there before the war. So these people were put in a refugee camp. And according to sources, the Navy could not have chosen a worse site to relocate the people of Sumai, as most of the homes were on a 45 degree slope. And the land was, for the most part, untillable and mosquito infested. Right? You take a population of 2,000 people who have lived in a place for generations are tied to this place as a community that relates to each other, 
and then you go and put them in the hills, right? And so think about what kind of social impact that's going to have on people. This is not just, oh, I'm going to move over here now, right? This has a big impact on the psyche of the people of Sumay. And it was hard, right? There was a lot of hardship. One of my aunts, Auntie Dolly, Dorothy Perez Williams, she said, they just moved us here. When we first moved, there's no plumbing. When you want to take a shower, you have to go to a big, long building, and they have showers, and everyone's using them. Guadalupe Wesley, when it's rainy, you have to get a bucket and wash your feet before you go into church. It's so muddy. We try to farm and ranch, but it's not that good. We plant a few vegetables, but it's not the same as in Sumai. Think about this. If you grow up for generations, the people of Sumai were farmers. They were people who fished. You've now taken them inland, away from the ocean, and to land where they cannot farm. This creates a situation where they need to figure out very quickly how to survive. Right? This is not a day and age where you just go to GPO and apply for a job at Chuck E. Cheese. There's no jobs. Right? So how do you survive this? Um, according to my late grandmother, Maria Sablon Pangolin and Paris, she said, too much change. No food, no store, no money. No nothing in Santa Rita. Nobody farms in Santa Rita. Fishing, if people go out to the sea and catch fish, they have to walk. But it's far, and there's no car. Okay. So in the years after the war, this creates a situation where the people of Sumai are trying to figure out what is our livelihood going to be. Um, Tan Tong Anu, it's different up here. Money, money, money. You have to have money. Everything is money. We have to understand that these people prior to the war didn't necessarily deal with money. Yes, they had wage-paying jobs to pay taxes, but for the most part, these people are on the lunsu, right? living off the land, living off the sea. But they survived, and they built something called Santa Rita, which has been classified in the media as a phoenix. A phoenix reborn once from the ashes of war, Reborn twice from the ruins of typhoons, it is a history full of violence, both natural and man-made, and each of its rebirths was accompanied by much agony. When you look at Santa Rita today and the community that it is, it was the people of Sumai that built that. This is former Sumai residents building the church in Santa Rita. They called it happy labor. Right? They took the time um, replacing the wooden structure with concrete volunteers posed with the Christian mothers, who provide food and drinks. This is volunteer labor, right? And the history books won't tell you about this. The history books will tell you that they just moved to Santa Rita, as if it was moving into a condominium complex. There's nothing there. It was these people that rebuilt this village. And they had to change the way that they survived, right? A lot of these people went from farmers and fishermen, fisher people, to becoming active political leaders, our first mayors of the village of Santa Rita. Okay? These are not your classic politicians that go and get college degrees and come from political genealogies. These are farmers and fishermen who rose to the occasion to serve as political leaders. Women who had never necessarily worked out of the home went and got educated and became teachers and entrepreneurs baking, sewing, doing whatever they needed to survive in this new climate, right? Where they could not just go farming and fishing, right? So when I did this research, this was very telling to me. This is the story of liberation. That yes, we have a story of liberation of heroic military men and women, but to me, this is the heroism here because they could have usually just said, you know, we're throwing the towel in and we're all going to go our separate ways. Yet they decided to remain together as a community and do what was necessary to thrive. In building what is today known as the thriving village of Santa Rita. This is the village flag. What, is to, what became very telling to me when I was doing this research, though, is that as someone who never lived in Sumai, right? These many years later, Sumai continued to be at the core of the identity of Santa Rita Village. If you look at this flag, the logo says, Tsapmu Malela Fahami Tautau Sumai. Don't forget that we are the people of Sumai. Right? 
There is an insistence on retaining that identity, those ties to that village. And you see it today in Santa Rita. There's banners all over the place. Hita Santa Rita, but Tauto Sumai still is a prominent marker of the identity. It's on our Liberation Day float. I heard that Agat won the Liberation Day parade yesterday, but <laughs> our floats continue to have the old church, right? So there's this persistence, this unwillingness to let go of Sumai. We may be from Santa Rita, but we're gonna make sure that the way we represent ourselves always goes back to Sumai. This was very um, telling to me as I was doing this research. One of the other things, the, the most striking thing to me though, was that everybody I had talked to, this was seven decades, over 70 years after they had been evicted from Sumai, to the day these people died and all of them, most of the people who I worked with on this project have passed away. To the day they die, and you members of their family can attest to this, they never let go of this longing for Sumai, this connection. My grandmother, it's never the same as when we left Sumai. Still up to now, I miss that place. I wish I can go back every day. We did this interview in 2007. So all of those years later, there's still place in her heart for Sumai. In Grasha Cruz Diaz Pangolin, and every day, or even nowadays when I fall asleep, I feel like I'm dreaming, I dream of Sumai. Like before, like what I'm doing in the past time that I'm staying in Sumai. I still always remember that. I'll never forget about it until I die or until my mind is loose which never happened. <laughs> In case they say we can go back right away, we'll go back now. Okay? So again, these many years later, they would go back if they could. They never really kind of let go of this connection to Sumai. Juan Tovis Guzman, I feel bad about it. I feel very bad about it. The place I was born, the place I was raised, I still call Sumai my home. I don't care whether the Navy is going to stay there until the duration of the end of the world. Still in my heart, Sumai is my homeland and Sumai is my best place. 100% okay. um, of the interviews, all the same kind of sentiment, right? That yes, I'm from Santa Rita now and I may never go back to Sumai, but I'm gonna say it, I wish I was in Sumai, right? Um, so we saw a lot of that. One of the interview subjects, though, that I dealt with, and this really kind of imparted on me a sense of responsibility and obligation, right? Because as I'm doing these interviews, I'm thinking in my head, how am I going to translate this into an academic paper to get my degree? Um, but it was Tan Tsong. She said, no more. No more people from Sumai. We are very few left. When I pass this world, I hope that at least one of my kids will remember where we come from, where they come from. There was a strong feeling among these people from Sumai, this worry that when they died, Sumai was gonna die with them. And there was this strong desire that they wanted their kids to know not only where their parents came from, but where these kids came from originally. So when Tan Tong told me this, I said, wow, that's a, that's what my academic research needs to be about, right? Is to give to the community, to my own generation, right? And younger, a sense of where they come from, right? And so we took off, we did this research. What I found through all this research is that Sumai lives. Okay? Not the way that it did in the 1940s and earlier, but in memory, in this constant attempt for those who were from Sumai to retain a connection, but to also pass it on to much younger generations. And as you're gonna see later, this had a, a domino effect. I finished my master's degree. I took all of those research that I did, uh, oral history interviews, archival research, my own personal exploration, and I wrote a 280 page paper. Got a master's degree. But something didn't sit right with me when I graduated. This is in Hawaii when I got my degree with my parents. And so the question was, well, what's next? Because I know I didn't like writing the 280-page paper. People are not going to like reading it. Right? 
Nobody wants to sit there and read a 280-page paper written for a professor. In fact, the only people that were reading my thesis at that time is when I would punish my nieces and nephews. <laughs> when they didn't listen to me, I'd make them read it to me out loud. This is my cruel and unusual punishment. And I said, I cannot make sumai be this, right? Sumai should not be punishment. Academics should not be punishment. So I stopped doing that. Um, but that was the thing. So, so what are we going to do now, right? Academics love my paper. People were reading it in the library. They were citing it. But academia is a very small world. Right? And in the back of my head, I said, well, what about the people of Sumai? How are they going to benefit from this? I got a degree out of their story. What now am I going to do to give this back to them in ways that is going to be all those things we talked about that's going to support Inafa Mauluk and Tsunsuli and Familia and Mamalo? I moved back to Guam and was very fortunate because many members of the community came out to help me brainstorm how are we going to take this steps forward. Around that time, the Santa Rita Church wanted to engage in fundraising um, to rebuild the, the structure right across the street from the church, which used to serve as a, a police house priest residence. They wanted to fundraise. And so we came up with the idea, let's make a commemorative book. My Mali, Marlo Santos is there, who's on the project. Um, several people from San Rita came out in full force and said, let's take that boring 280 page paper and maybe we'll do like a coffee table book, something that's beautiful with images, still has the story in there, but not necessarily pages and pages and pages. Right? Something that people could own. And we took it a step further because I said, I don't want to just repeat what I was doing in my book. So we opened it up to the village. And people were able to create their own pages within the book with their own stories of Sumai. Right? And so we were actually really surprised because I, don't, I think we printed 1,000 copies, maybe more. And they sold. We had a book signing at the December 8th Fiesta in that had to be 2013, 2014, and people showed up. They were buying this book. This generated thousands and thousands of dollars. And people said, hey, you should have just sold that book and you could have kept the money. I said, I didn't think about that. Um, <laughs> but that wasn't the point. The point was, how are we going to give it back to the community? So we created this book, um, very short book, but you know, professionally designed and including other people's through my stories. And then, like I said, it just dominoed. After that, I got an invitation from the commander of the US Navy, which was really awkward, right? Because the book is basically about how the Navy kicked these people out of Sumai. And now the Navy was asking me to come and do a book signing because they wanted to sell it at the exchange. <laughs> it's really awkward. But I said, hey, this is part of the process of reconciling historical wrong. If the military families want to buy this book in the exchange and learn about the Navy housing they're living on, then it's OK. Right? And what we saw was that the Navy started to interact a bit more with the people of Sumai, our elders, and even more importantly, the children of those military members. Right? The children didn't necessarily have to be military brats stationed on Guam, but now they were engaging in the history of the place that they were in. So I went and I signed books in the food court of the exchange, which was awkward, but I'm glad we did it. And I thought we were done, but we weren't done. Um, people like Shannon over there and Rita and Dominica from Guam PD said, hey, let's turn this into a community exhibit. And we did. Right? We created um, display panels that kind of outlined all the chapters in that book. And they started traveling the exhibit around Guam. Um, so that people, again, they don't want to read a 280-page book, but they can look at five panels right, and engage the story. Um, when I left Guam, I donated those panels to the Santa Rita mayor's office with the understanding that anytime anybody wanted to borrow those panels, they would be allowed to. So if you want them, call the mayor, and if you have problems, call me. Okay? 
because a lot of this I came to realize I don't own any of this. So many researchers come to Guam and they talk about things and then they keep it for themselves. I don't own the story of Sumai. The people of Sumai own that story. And so whatever we can do, whether it's a book or a community exhibit to make it accessible, that's what we do. Um, I mentioned Rita Nauta, who couldn't be here today. She's my aunt and she is a mover and a shaker. So all of a sudden I found myself on the radio <laughs> and on the news. It's a terrible picture, but it's the only one I could find on Google of me on KOM. Talking about this Sumai project, because outside of Sumai, people were starting to get interested in this notion of village history. Right? You open a Guam history book, it's not going to tell you the history of Umatic, the history of Zornia. It's going to tell you about big histories of political change. But people in the Guam community were really responding to this idea that history is right here in our village. Right? And so we took it on podcasts, television, other media. I'm told that um, some folks here on Guam now have taken the video footage that I did with my interviews and have now created a documentary about the story of Sumai. Um, that's awesome, right? Because that shows me that this is everybody's story. Everybody has a piece of the pie to turn it in, so keep an eye out for that. <laughs> that was not the end, and it spiraled. Okay, this led to not my work specifically, but everybody's contributions or focus on Sumai led to this idea of the annual Back to Sumai event. For those of you from San Rita, you know that for decades, the only opportunity that our Manana had to go back to Sumai was on All Souls Day. Right? Now, every April, there is an annual Back to Sumai event where the military allows the people of Sumai to go back to Sumai. And there is a mass that's celebrated, a fiesta, and many of the people from Sumai get to spend at least one day there. But what we started seeing in these efforts, more importantly, is that kids were coming out in full force. And that was the goal of these projects. Right? Not necessarily to keep our history with our elders, but to give the younger generation viable, tangible links to this place that they came from. And we saw it happen. Saw straight out of Sumai shirts being printed. Um, we saw young teenagers starting to claim this tie to Sumai. I was talking to 12-year-olds one time. They said, yeah, I'm from Sumai. I said, oh, you are? Um, that's good. They've never lived there. They will never live there. But we started to see them latch on to the Sumai identity, even in their artwork. Sumai, we love you. Um, I have a cousin that teaches at Harry S. Truman, and they've incorporated Sumai into the classroom curriculum so that the kids in that village have some sense of the history of the place where they're going to school. Okay, so a lot of this like I said, just kind of spiraled into things that I never planned. Um, a few years ago, the mayor called me and said, can you come to Fiesta? We're having a big Fiesta at the baseball field. We want to give you an award. As academics, we win awards. Every academic in this room, I can see you've all won awards. We win awards from national governments. We win awards from multi-million dollar whatever corporations. My award from the mayor of Santa Rita, though, is the most meaningful. They gave me this plaque, and it's appreciation for his dedication and commitment to protecting our identity and history for future generations to come. Uh, for your insight and enthusiasm in authoring Fenhasui Tautau Sumai. Ginini Tautau Sumai Dan Santa Rita Sijus Masi. This blew me away. I said, okay. We're getting recognized, and for me, this was not an award about me and what I was doing. It was a collective award because we had achieved this. As people working together in the community, we had achieved in Malik. We had made it good. We had elevated our families. Every family that has ties to Sumai was served through this project. We paid the ultimate homage to our village and the land and the sea that we come from. We had reciprocated. right? The, the, the suffering of our elders that they went through, we had something to give them back and say, it's okay, we will know where we come from. And you don't have to worry that we're gonna forget. 
And it was the ultimate act of respect. Again, this is not just me doing this. It was a community coming together, right, to make these things happen. And I just kind of want to close on this because we're in the, the midst of liberation that the story of Sumai Yes is very specific to my family, my community. Some of you may not have ties to Sumai, but I think it's important to recognize this for a couple of reasons. And one is that what happened in Sumai, what happened to Sumai, happened everywhere in Guam. After the war, everybody is losing land. Everybody is having to figure out how to make a living as the world is changing so quickly. I ask us to rethink liberation because when we deal with liberation, we celebrate as we should. What we see a lot of times though is that liberation is kind of framed more so in American military heroism. And we should, we should celebrate American military heroes because I personally will always be thankful. All of us who grew up with World War II survivors, there's always that same story, right? I was in Menengun, they were gonna kill me. And I looked into the jungle and a handsome white man walked out. Always a handsome white man. <laughs> a handsome man, he was tall. And he carried me out of Menengan. He saved my life. There's nothing wrong with that story. That's a very true story. My problem with the way that we celebrate liberation sometimes is sometimes that's the only story we hear. At the expense of what? The expense of our other heroes, right? What I learned from this project above and beyond what I've shown you is that our greatest generation, the World War II generation of survivors from Guam, are often framed in that narrative as very patriotic. We love America. We're so thankful for liberation. Again, all true. My, my point is not to deny that. But we, again, we should not let that make us forget what came with liberation and what we still struggle with as a people. I mean, I spoke with my grandmother, she said, for people that don't understand the situation, and in my thinking at my age, with things going on nowadays, the Americans being involved, we are very easy targets to take down. Guam is a very small place. They could come in and take over like in 1941. They could just attack and it won't take long. Guam needs an ally, needs somebody to watch over them. I think this is very real, right? For people especially that survived the war, we're concerned. We don't want that to happen ever again. With things happening in North Korea and all over the place, the military is, like she says, a great ally, right? Um, one of my elders that I interviewed, Julia Duenas Borja, we cannot go back because I want protection too for ourselves. For example, military protecting us from things that are dangerous for us, I don't hate state siders because of this and that, you know. Very common among our World War II generation, very common among the people of Sumai. As much as they're devastated by this eviction by the US military, everyone I talked to did not, they all had this sentiment. We are thankful, right, for this liberation. What I found though is researchers, when they hear this, then they close the book and they're done. I continue to just let them talk about their experience and their ideas. And this is just the tip of the iceberg for this generation. Spoke to Mr. Guzman, he said, before it's not contaminated. Now that it is used by the US government, I'm sure it's contaminated. But I like the young generation to remember that their grand, great grandparents, they suffer so much for the future generation. Even though the Navy comes and take your land, they can have it. Just give me what it's worth, because I can't go back there and plant. All their oil, their cement, the land is useless now. Okay. So among this generation, they were very aware of what their sacrifice was, and they weren't happy about it. Unlike the master narratives that talk about happy, patriotic tomorrows. Right? My grandmother said, I hope that you children never try that experience. I was so disgusted. I'm so disgusted with the Japanese and even the Americans. They move us and we don't know why they're moving us, right? It's not very common to, to hear this sentiment from this generation, but it's there. And we need to acknowledge that, right? Very provocatively, 
one of my aunts, this Navy, I hate it. They're not coming here to liberate the place. They need it because it's for their home port. Liberation is not for the Chamorro people. I, I show this to you regardless of where you are in the political debate on US militarism in Guam. I'm only showing this to you because I feel that this generation does not get their voice heard that much. They're always framed as these happy, patriotic people being carried out of Menengan by a blue-eyed, blonde-haired, handsome man, right? And that's true. That's great. We should thank the military. But at the same time, um, as especially as we celebrate 74 years out of this experience, there's still unresolved issues. People uncompensated. People still traumatized by their move from the land. Um, and so I, I encourage you to think about it in that sense. Um, and for me, I guess what I learned from this is, um, you know, this series is called Hita, Heritage, Ideas, Traditions, and Art. Um, I really encourage all of you, whatever you're doing, whether you're an educator, you're a politician, you're a government worker, you're in private corporations, is that we need to start mining our village histories and our place-based histories. Learning about big histories that are happening in the legislature and at Adaloop is wonderful. But if our kids don't know what's happening in their village, then we are creating a disservice to them. Because the more that we are spewing other people's heritage and ideas and traditions, the more we are silencing the strength of Amarnamku, the strength of the people of Sumai, for example. Um, and I think we need to stop doing that and start looking inward at our own villages. So just must it. Um, I think, let's see. There's something that they wanted to show, but before that, were there any questions or comments, anything that you want to share um, while we're all here in this beautiful Guam Museum? Any questions over there? Terry, please. That were them. Absolutely, and people are doing it. So if you um, Hope Cristobal Alvarez has produced the history of Sinahanya. Um, the Humatek Foundation does a lot of village plays. So this is happening. Um, one of the beautiful things, the reason that I throw this out there is because it, it needs to be a community effort so that it doesn't just stop at a book. It doesn't just stop at an exhibit that we empower our community studios. So people are doing it. And I think the more we do that, the better. Yes, let's give him a round. Um, thank you for that. I, I just want to say, too, that the work that we've done on Sumai, that's not the end of the story. There are so many other stories out there of people. And I think even just within our own families, I always make my nieces and nephews, I force them to sit down with my parents and just talk to them about when they were young, right? So that we can pass these stories on. The, the stories I've shared you are just the ones that I was able to collect, but thank you, because we need to keep collecting these stories. So thank you very much for sharing that. Any other comments? OK. 
too. So there are people who went through that in this room. So if they have anything to share about that, from what I was, what I learned was that the initial refugee camp was, be, um, if you know where Santa Rita store is in the church, the area going downward. Is that correct? The initial refugee camp. Uh, according to my grandmother, when it became apparent that these people were going to be settled permanently, there were certain, uh, a raffling procedure to raffle off, I think there were quarter acre parcels of land in the village um, to these people. But initially, it was um, a refugee camp, Quonset huts, homes that the people of Sumai built out of thatch and wood. You know, there was no documentation to show, but from what people remember, there was nothing over there. It was just jungle before the war. There was activity near the Fena Reservoir, which is near um, Santa Rita, but in the Santa Rita proper that we know today, I couldn't find anybody with a memory of anything there before the war. So really, they just kind of dumped them out there in the middle of nowhere. Yes. Yes, for several, thank you, sister. For several months, when the people of Sumai left the concentration camps after the war, after the war, when people left the camps, the first thing people did is they wanted to return back to their villages, find their families. For the people of Sumai, they would try to return to Sumai. There was a blockade. So many of them established makeshift homes in Apla. You're correct. Um, present day Navy Exchange commissary, those areas, which were previously where people in Sumai had their lunchrooms, um, but basically returned there for several months, I think till 1945, 1946, before they were finally moved up to this refugee camp. Yes. And I also want to add, because um, I've been caught blind by a lot of people about this, not everybody from Sumai moved to San Rita. Many families dispersed to the other villages. Um, the only reason I focus on Santa Rita is because that's where I'm from, but also that's your concentration of Tauto Sumai that decided to stick together as a community. Many other families went to other villages, but what's interesting is when we have these events back to Sumai, they come down from Totu, from Jigu, from all these places. So even those people who are dispersed outside of Santa Rita continue to, to retain those connections. <laughs> Hi, Mali. Hi, this is great. I think the impact is well known and also, you know, deserved for the people. So, even with the community as well, when KMS was built, they also identified it as Sumai, and that was a talk amongst them politically. How were they even going to name it? Because it was originally supposed to be Agate. Mm. So, there was a lot of talks too about that, and we're glad that they were able to stick with the Sumai KMS. I think also, too, it would be nice for us to maybe come together back to Sumai event in April and maybe as a community give to each other freely what we used to in the past. Some of us still farm. Some of us still have, you know, um, rights to fish and whatever. Um, but it would be nice to have that act also incorporated in the next Sumai event once a year to share as a community without buying, without selling. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's a huge point there, that when Sumai Peles was built, uh, the fact that they named it Sumai was a huge win for the people of Sumai and San Rita, right? And it may sound, you know, it's just about printing a sign, but it's, it's again, it's letting Sumai live in a place that's very relevant to young people. Everybody has to go to Peles, right? So Sumai now is no longer this thing that happened that's no longer there. Sumai is alive. It's not alive in the way that it used to be, but it's a testament to that spirit, right? That identity of Tauto Sumai insisting on moving forward in the 21st century.
Thank you. Always. My mind is always racing. Um, but, the, you know, when I went on to my PhD, my, my advisors wanted me to continue the Sumai research as a doctoral dissertation. And I told them, no, I don't want this to go into a space even more that's just for academic people. And so that's why when I returned home, we try to do more of these community projects. Um, it was a very fast kind of opportunity that came up when I left Guam to move to Hawaii. And I literally had four days to make this life decision. But one of the things that really pained me and concerned me is that if I left Guam, what was going to happen to Sumai? But it wasn't an issue because, again, Sumai is not mine. There were so many people that were behind this other than me that it was going to continue to do that domino effect. So while I'm happy to start thinking, I mean, this documentary film is a great new area to go into. I'm always thinking about new ways, but at the same time, what's that? It's the younger people's turn, right? I'd rather see teenagers pick up that torch and we support them to do it because if it's just one or two or 10 voices talking about Sumai, that's not, that's not the complete story. So I think for me now, I'm gonna claim my I'm old card and just sit in the back and support these younger, vibrant, far more tech savvy kids to, to take on what we all started. No, my advice to young people is put down your cell phone and turn off the TV and talk to your family. That's why I showed those pictures of my family because that's, I mean, I mean, we're guilty. We all have cell phone and WhatsApp, but we were very lucky. My grandparents didn't, I was already past 30 when my grandparents died. And so they were kind of this anchor that always brought us together. We're always in each other's faces and each other's business, but there was a beauty to that because it made us talk to each other. So my advice to young kids is just talk to your family. And that's what I did. I just sat there and I talked to my grandmother. And then through her stories, other people's names would come up. And I'd say, Grandma, do you think this person will talk to me? And she'll go to church and tell them, hey, <laughs> talk to my grandson. And it's slow. This is not going to happen overnight. It is an investment of time and passion. Not just assume any kind of research, right? So you cannot expect to just, A, can you, um, can you tell me all about this so I can write a paper? It's a long time. That's 12 years, and it's not done yet, right? So that's my advice, right? It's just hang out with your family. You don't need to go to a library necessarily. Yes. So it, it, it's timely, right? We need to do it um, and not wait on it. I, lucky thing, for me personally, I felt very fortunate because it's, <laughs> Dominica. Um, I felt very fortunate because when I finished the initial Sumai research, many of these Manamku started dying. Um, and I, I was very grateful that I was able to, to get some of their story before they left. But that's absolutely right. I mean, it needs to start now. Um, and I, I'm confident because I do think it's changing. When I went to UOG, professors didn't look like me or Mary or Lola. So we now have um, academics, community people, everybody that, that's kind of rising to that occasion. But you're right. It's time sensitive. 